Good morning, and welcome to the State Street Corporation's second quarter 2020 earnings conference call and webcast. Today's discussion will be broadcast live on State Street's website at investors.statestreet.com. This conference call is also being recorded for replay. State Street's conference call is copyrighted and all rights are reserved. This call may not be recorded for rebroadcast or distribution in whole or in any part without the expressed written authorization from State Street Corporation. The only authorized broadcast of this call will be housed on the State Street website. Now, I would like to introduce Eileen Fasal Beeler, Global Head of Investor Relations at State Street. Good morning, and thank you all for joining us. On our call today, our CEO, Ron O'Henley, will speak first. Then Eric Abwas, our CFO, will take you through our second quarter 2020 earnings slide presentation which is available for download in the Investor Relations section of our website, investors.statestreet.com. Afterwards, we'll be happy to take questions. During the Q&A, please limit yourself to two questions and then requeue. Before we get started, I would like to remind you that today's presentation will include results presented on a basis that excludes or adjusts one or more items from GAAP. Reconciliations of these non-GAAP measures to the most directly comparable GAAP or regulatory measure are available in the appendix to our slide presentation. In addition, today's presentation will contain forward-looking statements. Actual results may differ materially from those statements due to a variety of important factors, such as those factors referenced in our discussion today and in our SEC filings, including the risk factors in our Form 10-K. Our forward-looking statements speak only as of today, and we disclaim any obligation to update them, even if our views change. Now, let me turn it over to Ron. Thank you, Eileen, and good morning, everyone. We released second quarter results this morning. Let me begin by saying that I am very pleased with our continued strong financial performance. I am proud of our team members worldwide who continue to put our clients first and deliver these results for our shareholders. Turning to slide three, I will provide a brief update on how we are successfully navigating the COVID-19 operating environment while also delivering earnings growth for our shareholders. Providing exceptional service quality through improved client engagement, driving product performance, supporting the overall financial system, and safeguarding our workforce are all key priorities for us. We demonstrated success in each of these areas this quarter and delivered strong results for our shareholders as a result. Our clients are at the center of everything we do. You will recall that in 2019, we took a number of actions to improve client service quality, engagement, and decision-making. These measures have led to improved client engagement, which is critically important in the current environment, and its impact is evident in our results and business performance. Our clients are continuing to turn to State Street for our operational capabilities and solutions. During the second quarter, we effectively managed to onboard a number of new client projects across various client segments including a large asset manager, a significant asset owner, and a national wealth manager in CRD. Indeed, we see true sustainable momentum developing in our Alpha CRD platform. All this occurred while processing 13% and 35% increases in back and middle office transactions, respectively. We were the first service provider to support the launch of the semi-transparent ETF product, and we see strong demand in the market for this innovative solution. Our service quality is being recognized across the industry. For example, we are particularly proud of our ranking in the 2020 Euro Money FX survey, where State Street was named the number one FX provider to asset managers for the third consecutive year, with a number one ranking in overall customer satisfaction globally. This strong client engagement is reflected in our product performance. Our investment servicing assets under custody administration, which increased 5% quarter over quarter to $33.5 trillion, had another healthy level of new wins, amounting to $162 billion in the second quarter. Assets yet to be installed stood at a strong $1 trillion at quarter end. At Global Advisors, assets under management totaled $3.1 trillion, and we recorded $23 billion of total net inflows during the second quarter. 
Our spider range of ETFs recorded its best quarter of inflows since the fourth quarter of 2017, while spider GLD, the gold ETF, had its strongest ever level of inflows at $12 billion. Further, we are competing and winning in key strategic areas of focus for us. Our recently expanded and rebenchmarked range of low-cost ETFs also recorded its highest quarterly level of inflows at $11 billion. Our sector spiders made strong market share gains with almost half of sector industry flows going into the product during the second quarter. And we remain a flight to quality for cash management and liquidity solutions across a suite of product options. We continue to play a critical role in supporting the financial system. The operating environment remains uncertain as the pandemic continues to impact many parts of the world. While we have seen a partial recovery in some areas, many economic indicators continue to point negatively and unemployment remains high, reflecting the real human cost of this health crisis. State Street continues to support the broader economy and markets and is actively assisting client access to various Federal Reserve programs that support the flow of liquidity and credit. Currently, State Street is involved in five Federal Reserve programs, either directly, such as with the Money Market Mutual Fund Liquidity Facility, or as the program's custodian and administrator, such as the Main Street Lending Facility. Lastly, developing a high-performing organization and planning ahead for our global workforce also continues to be a priority. We continue to have about 90% of our employees working from home as we optimize a work-from-home model while leveraging technology to enable better collaboration and more effective ways to serve our clients. Last quarter, we took, um, we took measures to protect our employees and announced that through the end of the year, we suspended any workforce reductions other than for performance or conduct reasons in light of the COVID-19 crisis. Now we are going further for our employees by increasing their opportunities for mobility by launching an internal talent marketplace. By supporting our employees as they take on new roles and learn new skills, the marketplace will better develop and redeploy our internal talent to meet our evolving business needs and the growing demands of clients and stakeholders. Turning to slide four in our second quarter and first half performance highlights, I am, in, I am pleased by our continued strong performance and the progress we are making toward achieving our medium-term financial goals. Relative to the prior year period, total revenue increased 2% and fee revenue increased 5%. Second quarter EPS was $1.86, up 31% year over year, and ROE was 12.1%. I am pleased to report that our second quarter pre-tax margin improved by over two percentage points year over year to 27%. Our first half pre-tax margin increased by three percentage points. The front to back alpha platform strategy provides an attractive value proposition for our clients. Our second quarter performance was helped by the strong revenue performance at Charles River Development, where we had key business wins and renewals. The Alpha CRD pipeline continues to develop well with a good mix of deal sizes, functionalities, and scope. We expect to be announcing new major wins between now and year-end. Turning to expenses, the pandemic created an immediate challenge to our expense reduction planning relative to our original expectations at the start of the year. To help offset this impact, we took immediate action by implementing a hiring freeze launching the talent marketplace I just referenced, and reassessing all discretionary expenses. I am pleased to report that through our continued expense management efforts, further IT optimization, and operational productivity measures, we reduced total expenses by 3% in the second quarter relative to the year ago period. While we continue to invest in our business, first half 2020 expenses are now down 2% net of those investments relative to the year-ago period. For us, productivity management is a way of life as we continue to build on the strong culture of expense management we successfully established during 2019 when we undertook significant actions to improve our operational efficiency and reduce expenses through a comprehensive firm-wide expense savings program. We cannot control the economic environment, but we can control our expenses. 
Despite the challenges the COVID-19 pandemic has created, we remain highly focused on driving productivity improvements and automation benefits as we strengthen our operating model and enhance service quality, even during this challenging period. Turning to our balance sheet and capital, we are pleased with our 2020 CCAR results and the inaugural determination of our preliminary stress capital buffer at the minimum 2.5% level. The COVID-19 pandemic has provided an unprecedented real-time stress test, and our strong capital position has enabled us to operate effectively, help stabilize the financial markets, and support our clients, employees, and communities. While the environment remains uncertain, State Street's performance under the Federal Reserve's severely adverse scenario is another reminder of our business model's resiliency and our capital stability. We recently announced our intention to continue our quarterly common stock dividend of $0.52 cents per share in the third quarter. Consistent with the Federal Reserve's instructions to all large banks, we will be suspending share repurchases for the third quarter. As we look ahead, given our strong capital position, we will consider a full range of capital actions, including the resumption of share repurchases in upcoming quarters. We will, of course, take into account economic conditions, safety and soundness, the Federal Reserve supplemental CCAR scenarios and review process, our capital levels, and any interim regulatory limitations. <clears throat> to conclude, I am very pleased with this quarter's results, which demonstrates continuing revenue improvement even during difficult times, as well as further evidence of our ongoing ability to tightly control expenses while continuing to safeguard our employees and serve our clients. And with that, let me turn it over to Eric to take you through the quarter in more detail. Thank you, Ron, and good morning, everyone. Let me begin my review of second quarter by summarizing our year-over-year -year results on the left panel of slide five. EPS is up 31%, revenue is up 2%, expenses down 3% with expanding margins and healthy ROEs. And I think it is useful to point out that while we continue to operate in an extraordinary environment with a COVID pandemic, our results this quarter show strong underlying momentum and durability in our State Street operating model. Our bellwether servicing fees are up year on year. Our prior investments in our global FX and CRD franchises have yielded strong results. We've been able to carry a reserve build, and throughout all of this, we have continued to drive expenses lower and lower. And so, our pre-tax margin is up 2.3 points year on year, and our ROE is up 2 points. Turning to slide 6, period end AUCA levels increased 2% year on year and 5% quarter on quarter. The year on year move was driven by higher period end market levels and client flows, partially offset by previously announced client transition that had a de minimis effect on revenue during the quarter. Quarter on quarter, the AUCA increase, which is partially reported on a lag, was mainly due to higher period and equity market levels. AUM levels increased 5% year on year and 14% quarter on quarter to 3.1 trillion, driven largely by higher period and market levels and net inflows. Amidst continued and uncertain economic conditions, global advisors saw net inflows of 23 billion, driven by cash and ETF flows partially offset by institutional outflows. I highlight that our U.S. Spider ETF saw another strong quarter with $24 billion of inflows, which was well diversified once again. As Ron mentioned, our low-cost Spider portfolio ETF saw their largest quarterly inflow yet and continue to gain share. Our commodity ETFs and sector ETFs saw strong inflows too. Moving to slide 7, servicing fees were up 2% year-on-year, reflecting higher client activity and net new business, only partially offset by some pricing headwinds, which continue to moderate. Servicing fees were down 1% quarter-on-quarter, driven by lower average market levels, partially offset by higher client activity. Despite the recovery in equity markets since the first quarter, average domestic and international equity markets were still down sequentially, impacting servicing fees. However, client activity remained elevated, though down from March levels as market volatility persisted throughout the quarter. 
Amidst the ongoing pandemic, we have maintained business continuity and continue to provide clients with the benefits of our scale and diverse capabilities. On the bottom right of the panel of this page, we've included again some sales performance indicators that underline this dynamic. As you can see, AUCA wins totaled $162 billion in Q, with several deals coming through. Assets to be installed as of period end 2Q are strong at $1 trillion. We continue to have a strong pipeline of front-to-back alpha deals and expect multiple alpha announcements in the second half of the year. Turning to slide eight, let me discuss the other important revenue lines. Beginning with management fees, 2Q revenues decreased 4% year over year, driven by institutional product outflows and mix, partially offset by strong net inflows from both ETF and cash products. With the second quarter now complete and a better sense of the forward rates picture, we now anticipate that the likely impact of money market fee waivers, net of distribution expense, will be at the low end of our previously announced range, or just 10 to 15 million for the full year. As I mentioned earlier in my remarks, FX trading services saw another strong quarter with revenues up 26% year on year, but down 25% quarter on quarter as the business again saw elevated volumes and increased client demand, but down from the record levels seen in 1Q. The FX trading franchises continued to see market share gains and increased client engagement. As Ron mentioned, we saw strong results across the recently released 2020 Euro Money Survey securing the number one spot in global customer satisfaction and service, as well as the number one spot for all products and for electronic trading for our asset manager clients. Securities finance revenue decreased 27% year on year as agency lending demand for assets lightens and shifts towards lower spread fixed income assets, and as ongoing hedge fund deleveraging in falling markets drove down enhanced custody demand. Securities finance revenue was flat quarter on quarter. Finally, software and processing fees increased 46% year on year and more than doubled quarter on quarter, driven by significant revenue adds at CRD, which I'll talk more about shortly, and past positive outcomes in our market sensitive activity, which includes certain currency translation impacts and marks on employee long term incentive plans. These other items were positive this quarter in contrast to first quarter when they were notably negative. Moving to slide nine, CRD generated standalone revenue of $145 million, which was up 59% year-on-year and 45% quarter-on-quarter, driven by a large wealth implementation and several large asset manager renewals. We've always talked about the lumpiness inherent in ASC 606 revenue recognition standards, so while we are extremely pleased with these results, we remind you not to read across any one quarter. Moving to the right-hand side of the page, we were quite pleased to see the momentum in CRD this quarter overall and the progress we have made to expand the CRD presence in the wealth segment in particular, which you may recall was one of our key synergy commitments at the time of acquisition. Wealth now represents approximately 20% of CRD revenue and represents another area of growth for us. Turning to slide 10, NII decreased 9% year-on-year and 16% quarter-on-quarter. Excluding the impact of episodic market benefits of $20 million in the first quarter, NII was down 13% quarter-on-quarter. The sequential decline in NII was primarily driven by the full-quarter impact of lower market rates, including the impact of central bank intervention with more USD liquidity, driving lower-than-expected sponsor repo volumes. We continue to support clients' use of the Federal Reserve's Money Market Mutual Fund Liquidity Facility. As a result this quarter, MMLF balances averaged $19 billion and finished the quarter at $11 billion. You will see on the left-hand side of the slide that this quarter we, all, we are also showing our NIM excluding the impact of the MMLF. While MMLF had a positive impact on NII this quarter, its impact on our NIM was a negative five basis points. Average assets increased 13% quarter-on-quarter, and average deposits increased 9% quarter-on-quarter. However, period-end deposits decreased 22%, or $57 billion, 
quarter on quarter as a portion of the uptake in the deposits we saw at the height of the pandemic receded in the last few months. Given the Fed's expansion of the money supply, however, we do expect a good portion of the current deposits to stay with us, which we will reinvest in a mix of both loans and securities. Moving to slide 11, we've again included some color on the loan portfolio, as well as the company's allowance for credit losses. On the top panels of this page, you can see updated detail around our high-quality loan book and its characteristics. Compared to first quarter, average loans decreased 4%, while period-to-end loans decreased 17%, primarily driven by a reduction in client overdraft levels we saw during March. Overall, the loan book remains healthy with our largest lending category, capital call financing to private equity funds, seeing no change in borrowing patterns, but with continued strong demand for new facilities. Moving to the bottom panels, the allowance for credit losses increased to $163 million primarily due to a $52 million in provisions for credit losses, driven by changing economic conditions and ratings migrations, offset by $14 million in net charge-offs. You'll note we took advantage of the rally in the leveraged loan market to selectively de-risk our leveraged loan portfolio and exited certain positions, which effectively cost us $6 million, given the necessary reserve bills. So, a good trade. On slide 12, We've again provided a view of expenses this quarter, ex notables, so that the underlying trends are readily visible. Our 2Q20 expenses were down 3% year on year and down 1% quarter on quarter, excluding both notable items and seasonal expenses, with favorable trends across most expense categories. As we said last quarter, amidst the ongoing pandemic, we continue to execute on many of the investments and optimization savings initiatives detailed earlier in the year. And while we suspended workforce reductions through year-end, other than for performance or conduct reasons, in light of the COVID crisis, we have found additional expense opportunities to act upon. We continue to make progress on lowering compensation benefits costs, occupancy costs, and other costs, while IT costs are lumpy but on track. We're particularly pleased that our results reflected continued and sustainable expense reduction, notwithstanding the extraordinary market conditions, while also delivering top-line revenue growth. Moving to slide 13, on the right, you can see the evolution of set one and tier one leverage ratios. We are thus navigating this challenging environment with strong capital levels. In 2Q, our standardized set one ratio increased 1.6 percentage points quarter on quarter to 12.3%, driven by solid retained earnings and a reduction in RWAs as market volatility receded. The tier one leverage ratio was essentially flat at 6.1% due to higher capital levels offset by higher deposits. We were also pleased with our 2020 CCAR results. Our capital resilience under the Fed stress scenarios continues to demonstrate our low risk profile. And this year, we received a preliminary stress capital buffer requirement of 2.5%, which would have been much lower if it were not floored at 2.5%. As you know, the Fed has asked all large banks to suspend share buybacks in the third quarter. However, we expect to continue to pay a quarterly dividend of 52 cents per share. And finally, as Ron noted, the firm's capital position remains strong amid, amid the uncertainty created in the COVID-19 pandemic. Accordingly, we will consider a full range of capital actions, including the resumption of share repurchases in upcoming quarters, but we'll do so considering economic conditions, safety and soundness, the Fed supplemental CCAR scenarios and review process, our capital levels, and any interim regulatory limitations. Turning to slide 14, we've again provided a summary, summary of our 2Q results. As we mentioned earlier, we are pleased with the results and believe they are a reflection of the durability and resiliency of State Street's business model, as well as our focus on delivering on our strategy of both growth and productivity. Throughout this crisis, we have differentiated ourselves by proactively reaching out and assisting clients through these difficult times. We believe that our resiliency during this extraordinary period and our constant attention to service quality has created goodwill with our clients and positioned us for share gains over the medium to long term. 
Last quarter, I, I outlined our full year financial outlook under a certain set of assumptions, noting that there was a range of possibilities as a result of the potential length of the COVID pandemic and the associated economic impacts. I would like to update those expectations with our current thinking, again noting there remain a broad range of possible outcomes. We now expect global central banks will keep short rates at current levels for the remainder of the year, and long-end rates will stay at a June 30 spot rate through year-end. We also now assume that average global equity markets levels for the remainder of 2020 will be flat to current levels. As a result of our client uh, engagement, moderating pricing pressure, and CRD and alpha front-to-back wins, we now expect that full-year fee revenue will no longer be down 1% to 2% year-on-year for the full year 2020, but instead will be up approximately 1.5 to 2%, with servicing fees expected to show a year-over-year improvement relative to 2019. Regarding NII, given the impact of continued lower long-end rates on the investment portfolio and central bank intervention with more USD liquidity driving down the expected repo volumes, we now expect NII to be down approximately 9 to 11% on a sequential quarter basis and expect the fourth quarter to be relatively in line with the coming third quarter. Turning to expenses, we remain laser-focused on driving sustainable productivity improvements and achieving automation benefits. We expect that full-year expenses will now be down at the better end of our previous guide of down 1% to 2% year-on-year, excluding notable items, as we continue to find ways to control and drive down expenses. In regards to our provision for credit losses, we continue to see a range of outcomes based on evolving economic conditions and any ratings migrations. On taxes, we expect our tax rate for the full year to be closer to the lower end of our 17 to 19 percent range. And with that, let me hand the call back to Ron. Thank you, Eric. Uh, Operator, can you open the call to questions? Thank you. To ask a question, you will need to press star and then 1 on your telephone. To withdraw your question, please press the pound or hash key. Please stand by. We compile the Q&A roster. Your first question comes from the line of Brian Bedell from Deutsche Bank. Your line is open. Great. Thanks. Good morning, folks. Um, Thanks for taking my questions. uh, Eric, if you could just unpack a little bit the um, NII guide just um, in terms of what you're seeing for uh, client deposit levels um, moving into 3Q and, and to what extent um, your uh, your guidance for 3Q and 4Q includes more reinvestment um, or, or more shift of deposits uh, into uh, longer, longer, term, longer term securities. I'm sorry. And also, one, one more on, on that uh, is the, um, the the repo financing um, business in terms of um, in terms of the impact. It looks like that was much lighter in the second quarter. Um, so, your, just your thoughts on that for the second half as well. Eric, you're muted. Oh. Brian, it's Eric. Thanks for the question. Uh, we're clearly navigating through some uh, challenging uh, uh, times with, in- with the interest rate environment, and obviously trying to do our best to uh, uh, to, uh, to navigate uh, through. Um, when you think about the uh, NII guide, um, you know there's clearly the the continued downtick in long-term rates, which uh, which is affecting uh, the investment portfolio, and will continue to some extent in the coming quarters after that. And then there is some, you know, lower volume sequentially in overdrafts, and then the MMLF balances that are also contributing to that, uh, to the second quarter to third quarter decline. I think once we get to that level, part of what uh, uh, happens is that you've got offsetting factors. You've got on one hand the lower long end rates, which uh, put a uh, um, which, which tend to tractor through the investment portfolio uh, for another couple quarters, which creates a, a, a downdraft. And those, I think, can be offset uh, uh, by the growth in the investment portfolio and lending base, which is really supported by the higher levels of deposits that we're operating at. 
Now, it's hard to tell exactly, you know, what the what the deposit levels are going to be, but I think if you if you if you stare at the data um, that we we've, we've shown here, you know, we used to run at 155 to 160 billion of deposits. First quarter average was solidly at 180. Second quarter average is solidly at 197. You know, we think we're going to land somewhere uh, between those uh, those two points, which means that off of the original base of the call it 160 billion of deposits, there's an ability to expand the investment portfolio, put on uh, duration, uh, carefully uh, and selectively invest in some uh, some high quality uh, positions to maintain our uh, our HQLA. And we think that together, you know, should create some stability uh, on uh, on an II uh, in the uh, in the coming quarters. Um, the sponsored repo program, um, as you mentioned, uh, did create a downdraft from uh, 1Q to 2Q. And what we're seeing there is that the overnight repo rates are less attractive than they've been relative to one-month treasury rates, and so that creates reduction in volume. Um, if that were to persist, then you know we're not going to get a, a lift there, and we're not going to get the volumes we'd like to see. On the other hand, if that normalizes back, you know there could be some upside uh, in the coming quarters, but but more more time will tell before we can uh, incorporate that into our forecast. Okay, great, that's super helpful. And then maybe on CRD, the um, you know very strong quarter, um, very encouraging on the wealth. Management wins. Uh, maybe just a two-part question, uh, Eric, um, on the revenue trajectory. Obviously, um, it's lumpy, like you said. Uh, maybe if you can just um, try to characterize what you thought was was one-time um, uh, licensing fee revenue within uh, the second quarter, and then maybe Ron, if you want to talk a little bit about the about that wealth strategy, sounds very encouraging in terms of um, of, of of the win that you've announced and and uh, potential new wins down the road. And maybe just in terms of sizing that space uh, for you, you know what, what you're doing there on the wealth side that's different uh, than the institutional asset manager side at CRD. Yeah, Brian, why don't I start and then uh, turn it over to Eric? So I'll start in the latter part of your of your question there. Um, as as I uh, as we mentioned when we acquired uh, Charles River that. Uh, uh, in addition to its core institutional client segment, uh, it had developed a, a fair amount of technology applicable to the uh, uh, to the wealth segment, particularly the the, the larger wealth manager segment, um, large uh, private wealth managers, wirehouses, et cetera. And uh, that is, uh, we, we've uh, we, we've continued that R and D, um, and also leveraged our own client relationships uh, to be able to help propel that growth. Growth and that's what you're seeing playing through. Uh, we see it as a as a uh, solid and additional form of growth on top of the core institutional business. Um, you know, right now I think it's about 20% of the business, up significantly from uh, when we acquired it, and we would uh, expect it to be growing uh, probably a little bit more uh, than the uh, uh, at, at a slightly higher level than the uh, than the institutional business. And the, the good news about this is that it shares uh, the same technology and operating platform. I mean, there are certain sub-applications that are different, but the, uh, uh, we, we can do this at scale um, easily. And the way I would say you should think about um, the, the lumpiness, I mean, Eric will take you through the, uh, uh, how the accounting actually works, but um, when you start to see kind of a positive lumpiness like this, I mean, it's essentially a client being installed. And it's at the point then that we can start to uh, uh, recognize revenue, and following that will be ongoing recurring fee. So that's how you should interpret the lumpiness. It's not necessary. It is one time as it relates to that client, but it's certainly not one time. As we continue to grow, uh, you'll see that same kind of, uh, of, of lumpiness. Brian, let me let me add some texture and even some numbers to that so that you can get a better sense of the underlying uh, revenues here because we're quite quite pleased with the growth trajectory we're quite pleased with the pipeline with the you know kind of contracted but not yet installed levels uh, we, we track a number of different metrics here uh, to uh, to give us confidence in the developing uh, uh, growth um, the revenues really come I'll call it broadly into two buckets there is 
SaaS revenues and professional services. And SaaS revenues are pretty straightforward. You know, you win a client, it's a five-year contract, and the revenue recognition is that the revenue is, is rateably applied over those five years. Very, uh, very straightforward. And in fact, we want to be in the business of growing SaaS revenues over time and professional services because those create a very regular and recurring set of uh, revenues. The second part of the revenues come from uh, on-premise installations, and we have a number of clients who've had on-premise installations and even some who continue to prefer them. And in those cases, the revenue recognition is, uh, comes in two parts. Uh, you have an upfront piece, which could be in the range of around 60% of the contract, and then uh, you have the balance, the call it 40% in the example I've given you, which could be rateably over the contract length if that were, say, a four- or five-year contract. And so you get a piece, and then you get, um, uh, you get a, a trail uh, behind that. So those are the two big pieces. You know, when, when, uh, when, when we look at the, the revenue numbers that we showed you on page nine, you know, you go back. You, what we want to be doing is we want to be growing both pieces, to be honest, uh, and in particular the regular, uh, the, the first one, the, the, the very recurring uh, revenue base. Um, if you go back on page nine and you look at the data we showed around revenues, you know, back in the second quarter of 2019, we had 90 one million of revenues, about 65% of that was in SaaS and professional fees. And so it gives you a sense for the kind of the relative amount. If you go forward to the quarter of this year, the, um, those recurring SaaS and professional fee revenues were just over 80 million. So we see both, we see nice growth, uh, you know, year on year. And in fact, it's happened consistently over the five quarters. And then the balance of the 145 has been more in the on-premise kind of uh, revenue installations where you get a good-sized piece up front, but then the recurring piece in the, in the future. And I think if you step back with that kind of revenue recognition, where we're focused on growing uh, client and client engagements, and some clients are delighted to be on the SaaS pro, uh, platform, and we've seen consistent growth there, so that gives us some confidence in the kind of the the, the completely recurring uh, base, and then you have uh, the uh, the the uh, the more on-prem kind of revenues, which start off with a piece, they then have a trail, all right, and then when the contract ends, you get another piece in the uh, that that's lumpy, and then in a trail after that, and that's just the nature of the beast of how. Um, uh, how the revenue recognition works. All in, we're quite pleased with this revenue trajectory. You know, the backlog, the uh, the contracted but not yet installed, and the sales performance. And so, while you see some lumpiness, um, it's uh, you know we're seeing good good underlying uh, metrics as well. Right, that's great, color and a lot of detail. Thank you very much. Your next question it comes from the line of Betsy Graphic from Morgan Stanley. Your line is open. Hi, good morning. Morning, Betsy. Um, I wanted to understand a little bit on the expense side. I know you called out um, you know, improvement there in part from things like market data, which is uh, you know, really impressive given that market data cost for most, you know, participants is moving higher and higher every quarter. Um, so just wanted to get a little bit of color on that and on the sub-custody savings, and, and to what degree is there more legs there in that uh, you know specific line item in your expenses? Betsy, it's uh, it's Eric. You know, both of those are uh, are sizable expense uh, um, categories. They both are uh, part of the transaction processing uh, you know line item that we report, um, and you know what we found is that. Uh, we, we, we need to just actively manage those. Um, you know, sub-custody is something that, that we need provided uh, to us. And so, you know, we've worked with some of the largest banks as well as some of the, you know, country banks to, to find the best mix of, of service at a, uh, at, a, at, a, at a declining cost level. You know, and our view is that that's something we need to keep uh, doing uh, year after year 
and we've um, you know we've been able to deliver I think some good savings this year, and our expectation is to continue that trajectory. Market data is a little more complicated. To your point, is that there is a, a plethora of market data uh, uh, ingestion that's possible, and what we found is that we need to both manage the ingestion uh, uh, pipes because if we you know secure market data in too many different pipes, then we end up you know uh, you know buying more than we need. We also need to find uh, vendors, and, and over the last couple quarters, we've started to really work more closely with several of our vendors around who gives us the best cost and pricing kind of quality levels, and that's also been factored in. And then there's a third piece, to be honest, on market data, which I find uh, um, helpful from a client standpoint, to be honest, which is some of our market data costs are borne by us, which we want to drive down, but with the right quality. And others, uh, market data costs are sometimes born with our, by our clients, and we're, uh, in many cases, working with our vendors against both pools of market data to try to secure the best results for, uh, uh, for them as well. So lots of activity there. What I would tell you is that some of what you see on that transaction processing line is the result of some you know, intense focus on those areas, and it's actually a bit uh, of an example of what we're doing in other areas. You know, we talked about starting to drive our technology costs down. And so we're doing, you know, similar work on hardware uh, costs and hardware vendors, working with them in a more active way. We're doing that in uh, software and maintenance contracts on the technology side. And so it's really become an expanding, I'll call it expertise, but sort of, you know, partnerships and approaches that we've taken I think to good effect, but to be honest, one that we need to you know repeat year after year to get the the, the benefits that we'd like to help drive our expanding margins. Okay, and so you've got some more legs there is the nut of that answer. Um, and I appreciate all the color. It's interesting, uh, especially with the client side of it. The the follow up I have for you, Eric, is regarding the net interest income, net interest margin outlook, and I know you had the nine to eleven percent down QQ and three Q, and then stabilization into four. Maybe you could give us some color on the assumptions around the four Q stabilization. What has to happen uh, for that to come through? Yeah, the four Q stabilization um, is really driven by I think the economic uh, kind of the interest rate environment first and foremost. So we're assuming you know short end rates stay more or less where they are, and we're assuming long end rates stay more or less where they are. You know the forwards always have some some expansion and, and increase, and I think you know we've gotten a little gun shy about always planning for those, and so we feel like we should plan at the at the current levels. So that's the first part of the assumption base. I think the second part of the assumption base is that um, there is some normalization of deposits, but as I've said, I think we've got a a, a nice chunk uh, there that we can begin to think of as, uh, or that we, we are confident are stickier, and it depends uh, on the speed of our reinvestment in the you know investment portfolio into some asset classes that we're comfortable with, and I think that will factor uh, factor in as well. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks. Your next question comes from the line of a Glenn Shore from Evercore ISI. Your line is open. Hi, thanks. A uh, quick follow-up question on the expense side. I heard your overall comment, so that's what matters most. But um, w within this quarter's 3.3% uh, drop, 3 .3 drop down, 40% of the reduction in expenses was uh, lower marketing and travel. I'm assuming that's the product of the environment. Uh, so, so how much of that is is sustainable or works its way back in? Again, I appreciate it. it's probably part of your overall uh, expense comment. Yeah, Glenn, that's that's fair because uh, as, as you just as you um, as, as as you know, we're trying to find sustainable expense reductions this year and then into next year and if we just brought them down and they pop back up that doesn't uh, that doesn't count neither for our shareholders nor for us um there are some uh, tailwinds of travel expenses and even some medical benefit claims you know are lighter uh um uh in the uh, uh in the expense um uh trends 
But remember, there's also some headwinds that we would have, or actions and areas where we would have driven expenses down that we weren't able to. And so, uh, as, 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 a, as a, you know, the biggest simple example is the, uh, is the uh, pause on, on layoffs because of the pandemic. You know, that would have been worth uh, at least half a point of expense reduction, if not a little more, uh, for every quarter this year and on a full year basis. Uh, and um, I think what's, what, what we're going to have to do next year is go back to what we've been doing, driving down all of our costs, our compensation benefit costs, where we'll be able to now action that um, and continue to drive down uh, third-party spend costs as well. And so I think, we're, I think, I think the trends will line up. There are just going to be some, uh, some ins and outs or headwinds and tailwinds at any point. Um, but we, 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 we see a path to continue doing what we're doing, uh, which is to drive expenses lower uh, and lower year after year. Okay, I appreciate that. And then uh, during the quarter, uh, you announced a venture with FNZ on servicing in the wealth management space. I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about what the target of that venture is they seem to have a really strong operation in Europe. What you bring to the table, what they bring to the table, that'd be that'd be great. Thanks. Yeah, Glenn, it's Ron. Um, so uh, FNZ uh, uh, has a very strong operating platform. Its target market is a, uh, or certainly in the in the U.S. would be a uh, the the smaller end or, or a, a lower uh, uh, end in terms of size of market segment than we do in. Charles River and CRD. Um, so it's quite complementary to what we do. Uh, we would also, uh, you know, we would we would be their custodian and administrator uh, as they uh, as they move into that space. So we view it as a as a uh, as a way to uh, expand into a uh, in, into even further into wealth in a segment that we wouldn't naturally have leading capabilities in. Number one. Uh, number two, they've got some uh, really interesting technology that we want to continue to figure out how we can use uh, elsewhere. So it, it's a way of of getting some technology leadership, but uh, uh, you know, as, as well as a revenue stream at a relatively low cost for us. Okay, thanks very much. Your next question comes from the line of Brennan Hawken. From UBS, your line is open. Uh, <clears throat> good morning. Thanks for taking my questions. Uh, first, I'd like to follow up on uh, the Charles River commentary and the front end fees versus you know, that that trail and the trail dynamic. It, it sounds like that's a little less than half of this quarter's revenue. Um, so, wanted to confirm that's the case. And then, um, is the onboarding? You know the the install the, the front or end, front end is that a multiple quarter dynamic, or is that a single dynamic? How does the trailer in those arrangements compare to the upfront? So how should we think about the continuing revenue dynamic? And then how long are those contracts, and what's the typical retention rate? I just would love to get a better dimension for the cadence of those revenues, if if you can provide some of that. Thanks. Brennan, it's uh, it's Eric. Uh, it's it's fair to, to to get into the the details because the details do matter. Um, but uh, as we do that, let me let me remind you there's a range of details, and so let me let me try to to, to answer the questions, and we can certainly uh, follow up with you and other investors that are curious. But this is uh, a bit of the the bankers, uh, you know, uh, uh, working in a software space, which uh, which just operates in a in a different cadence with uh, ASC 606. Um, first, the the recurring revenues, the SaaS kind of implementations are pretty straightforward, and I think I gave the numbers there, and I think you've got the right mix. The the mix in each of these quarters has always been uh, much more uh, uh, kind of fast professional services. The the completely, I'll call it completely. Uh, stable uh, revenues, and those have been building uh, nicely, and I think we're quite pleased with that trajectory. Um, on the, the, the lumpier part of the revenues, which is the on-prem, uh, on-premise uh, installations, um, the, the answer is there's a range of different situations which have to do with con different contract lengths, 
And so let me just give you a sense. You know, contract lengths can, can range uh, from, call it, three years to, you know, eight years, right? And for, uh, for those kinds of ranges, then you tend to get, uh, you know, on three-year contracts, you might get uh, 70% uh, up front and then the other 30% over the, 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 the rest of the three years, and it comes in kind of, you know, year by year by year or quarter by quarter by quarter to the effect, or um, for a, something like a seven or eight year contract, um, you'll tend to get about 50% in the first year, and then the other 50% in those seven or eight years rateably. Um, and so there's a range, but I think it's, it's, it's I don't know, it's the accounts way to, to, to measure the revenues in a reasonable way, and you'll, you'll have to uh, uh, talk with them if you like it or not. I, I can't really opine there, um, but that, that's the range. Um, the upfront uh, piece comes in in a particular quarter, and why is that? Because that's when the system literally goes live and is beginning to serve clients, so it becomes in service. And it's the quarters after that, through the length of the contract, that you rateably uh, uh, see the rest of the, uh, the revenues. Um, what, what I do want to remind folks, though, is that once we have a client, the client retentions in our business are very, very high. Um, you know, we, 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 uh, we retain most of our clients. And so, you know, in a three-year contract, you'll, the, the description that I just gave of, 70% plus a 30% over the trail, three years later gets repeated, right? Uh, same for a five-year contract five years out. And so in a way, you know, we're, we're a little hesitant when people occasionally say, well, that's one time. It's not really one time, right? It's, it's, there's a good piece up front. There's a good piece rateably uh, brought uh, that, that, that we've secured. And then there is almost always the, uh, the extension, which brings the same uh, thing again, it's just that it's a little lumpier than uh, than we'd all like. So maybe maybe I'll pause there, but happy to talk more at the right time. Well, well one one more piece of my question, I think that you might have forgotten, Eric, is the retention rate. Do you, what's the historical retention rate on those three-year reups? I mean, we can. I think it's very high. I, I, uh, we, why don't we Why don't we do a little follow up and get that out to you in a in a reg FD okay. session? But it's uh, we. It was part of our diligence of retention rates. Uh, before I pull a precise number, let me let me come back to you. But it's very very high. Yeah. It's something that gives us a lot of confidence because remember, once you have an on premise installation, like you've invested a lot internally at the on the client side to integrate it. With your, um, you know, with your, uh, with your estate, uh, with your other uh, systems and subsystems, and so there's a there's a willingness and there's an ability which which together, you know, result in very, uh, you know, very strong, um, very high renewal rates. Yeah, Brandon, yeah. it's Ron. Okay. Maybe maybe just to reinforce why that is. Um, I mean, typically what goes on in these conversions is uh, there's a pretty big and significant operating model change that goes on at the uh, asset manager or the wealth manager. So typically a new client is not that we're displacing somebody like Aladdin. Typically it's a client that's got a bunch of bespoke and scattered uh, technology, and they're moving to a comprehensive kind of, uh, of, of system like this. So that's why you get a, you know, very, very high retention rates because – Frankly, the switching costs on the client side are pretty high. Yeah, thank you for that. Appreciate all that color, Ron and Eric. And then uh, following up on, you gave some great color on expenses, and I understand it's really hard to be too granular, Eric, to your point in the unusual operating environment that we're in, but I'm going to give something a shot anyway. Um, you, have you reviewed your real estate foot, footprint? You know, um, Boston is a fairly expensive city, and 
when you look at the, your website, it seems like you have three different offices in the city. You know, is that really the optimal footprint based upon the experience that we've been seeing here early read on um, the uh, uh, pandemic and the shutdown? Uh, have you rethought uh, the potential for remote or distributed uh, uh, workplace arrangements? How much do you think you can compress your occupancy expense you know, over the next few years on the back of some of that. Brendan, it's Eric. Let me start on that to give you a little bit of kind of uh, near in views and uh, Ron, Ron might weigh in as well. And in fact, I might, I might ask your CFO the same question when I, uh, uh, when I, when I see him next, because I think every CFO out there, not just bank CFOs, is wrestling uh, with this specific question. You know, here at State Street, we have occupancy expense of about uh, 435 million bucks, and we had already plans to drive it down this year by about 5%. So, you know, taking a chunk out of that, and part of that is, you know, continued rationalization of our high cost location footprint, and um, uh, you know, uh, uh, taking advantage at the same time of some of the productivity, right? Think about some of the headcount management that we've done around the world as well. Um, I think I think in the very near term, a couple things happen in real estate. One is, you know, we just don't add any real estate, and you know, Ron and I put an immediate halt as soon as this pandemic uh, happened. And let me tell you, there's no, there's no that a halt is 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 perpetual practically. Um, it then it does have a little bit of an effect where we can't easily sublet. So now what we're doing is going back to every lease uh, um, that we have. And literally going through and asking the question, uh, uh, you know, when does it roll over? The, the question that it really wrestles through is what kind of um, occupancy rate can you operate at? And if you know, most of us have operated at the, you know, call it 85 to 95 percent occupancy rate. And I think what this pandemic has demonstrated is that the tools and the capabilities through technology and uh, uh, the um, the methods that we have in a company is uh, we can we can drive occupancy rates up to you know we were originally planning to 130 140 um, percent just by thinking about people's um, historic approaches to being in the office or not um, and I think that that is kind of what gives us a view that if we originally thought we could get to 120 percent occupancy rates. And you know now with the pandemic, we're confident we could get to 150 percent. That's how you start to get some real leverage on the occupancy cost. I think the the one thing that gets in the way of that, and I'm I'm taking a very kind of financial lens because we have to think about our 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 our, our people, our teams, our clients, and all the interactions and all that they do, is we we also. Um, need to be respectful of some of the social distancing requirements in the immediate term. And so I think what we have is we have a period right now where, you know, work from home is uh, um, is 90 percent, let's say. Um, with social distancing, we can bring a certain number in. Um, at some point, there's a vaccine, so the social distancing may not be, you know, uh, at the same level as it is now. And we have a whole group of employees who've learned to operate incredibly effectively, work from home, some of whom prefer to be home. And, and uh, so I think, I, I think there's a lot to do here is, I guess, the summary. I tell you, we're already driving down occupancy costs. And I think the question that we'll come back to in the coming quarters and in the coming year is um, how much more. It's not that they, can't, that, that they won't come down. They'll come down. I think it's a question of scale off of that base of expense that I uh, um, that I circled up front. Yeah, uh, Brennan, what I would add, Brennan, it's Ron, what I would add to that is in a fairly short period of time, we've gone through uh, three kind of phases of work. Uh, work from home uh, was about a one week event for us uh, and we got 90% uh, of the people out of the buildings and into a home environment. We started about three weeks after that planning the return to office. Uh, which you know, is in Asia Pacific, as you can imagine, we've started back. Um, um, also, parts of Europe uh, slower in Europe for all the reasons that we know. Uh, we've also launched the third phase of this, which is what we're calling the workplace of the future. 
uh, which is uh, encompasses a lot of the thing that, uh, things that Eric is talking about. To your point on Boston, as we had announced earlier, uh, we are uh, we, we announced uh, late last year that we're vacating uh, this headquarters tower at the end of 2022, um, going to oper uh, move to a new building in Boston, but is much more flexible, better terms, lower amount of space. And it's early enough now that we have ability to, uh, you know, to customize that even further, given what we know about COVID-19. So, um, again, I don't believe that uh, we could operate or should operate anything near 90% work from home, but we can operate on a much more flexible basis with work from home being an integral part of what we do. Uh, it's certainly part of our disaster recovery now, so you should start to see us uh, shedding disaster recovery spaces too, and you should expect and hold us to uh, a much lower f footprint uh, really starting quite soon. That's great. Eric, Ron, Eric and Ron, thanks for all the caller. And of course, Eric, happy to line up a discussion with my CFO. He can give you tips on how to deal with my annoying questions. <laughs> Thank you, Brennan. <laughs> Your next question comes from the line of Ken Uston from Jeffries. Your line is open. Uh, thanks. Good morning, guys. Um, Eric, I was wondering if you could give us a little bit more color underneath your, your full year fee outlook. And I know given that you've got the CRD comments you talked about and then F uh, transaction activity, but can you kind of walk us through how you're now seeing um, the bigger buckets uh, move both sequentially and year over year, uh, given the you know at least the average asset pricing we have and your earlier comments about fee income pressure um, moderating? Thanks. Sure, Ken. Um, you know, part of the reason we gave an overall fee guide is that there, there's always go, uh, there always are, and there are always going to be some uh, uh, some ins and outs uh, in that uh, uh, in in the various fees. Um, I think if you if you think about the the different buckets, you know, the texture that I'd give uh, against the full year guide of one and a half to two percent. Um, First, on servicing fees, I think we feel positive. We've, we've delivered year-on-year you know, -year growth in servicing fees now um, uh, for the first quarter year-on-year -year, and then the second quarter year-on-year, -year, and we think that'll be a, a, a positive for the year. And that's different. I, 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 uh, I, uh, I contrast that to previous years, you know, where we had uh, more fee headwinds um, or where uh, 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 we didn't feel like we had the performance we would have liked. Um, but we think servicing fees will be positive, and that's without an average equity market uptick, really, because you know globally uh, equity markets are kind of in the you know more uh, more more flattish uh, range. Um, management fees, I think, are are doing well. You know, we've, we've been a little more negative there. We'd like to uh, do a little bit uh, better than than, uh, than 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 what we've done. Uh, FX trading, and then all the electronic services around that will be a, a clear positive. Um, sec lending a little lighter as we described some of the shifts there, although an uh, area that we're uh, we're working on. And then uh, you know in uh, the software and processing fees, I think we're quite confident on uh, uh, the Charles River uh, momentum, you know, uh, especially with some of the uh, recent uh, wins. And then there's the kind of the uh, there's some other uh, in that line. There's some other business activity or loan fees or other. Uh, uh, software fees, et cetera, and then there's some of the lumpy stuff that we have to just uh, take in marks. So all in all, though, you know, full year, one and a half to two percent is what we see today, um, which, uh, you know, is, I think, uh, gives us the, um, uh, the, the, the positive momentum that we'd like and then something to build on for next year. And our view is, you know, if we can, if we can drive even, you know, uh, low single-digit uh, fees, uh, upwards and continue to drive expenses down. You know we're uh, we're 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 getting the right uh, right uh, you know results. Yep. And uh, one big picture one for Ron. Uh, Ron, last quarter you talked about the. Uh, a uh, little bit of a push off in, in either um, installations and you know client discussions because of just everything that we're dealing with. Um, 
your win rate in servicing was about flat. Can you talk, and you've talked about the potential wins on the CRD side, the wealth management platform. Can you just talk about just the conversations that are happening now and how that's evolving just in terms of the core business and any sense that that's starting to open up at all? Yeah, Ken, as, as we talked about last quarter, uh, we, we said that it was our sense that just given the additional challenges posed to asset managers and asset owners operating models uh, of COVID-19, that we thought that we'd see even uh, at some point an increase in conversations and interest in outsourcing and operating model changes in general. And that's actually started to happen. Um, and and was, it started to happen in a big way in the second quarter. So we see continued interest in, um, you know, not just uh, – movement of back office to the lowest price, but much more about how do we comprehensively improve, how do we, the our asset owner or asset manager, comprehensively improve our operating model through changes to their back office and even to their front office. So that's continuing. Um, and it's we've, uh, as, as I noted in my opening remarks, uh, the uh, as a result of that, we would expect to see uh, uh, and be in a position to announce some significant new wins between now and the end of the year um, that are some combination of front, middle, and back office of, uh, of, of, of notable names. Got it. Thank you, Ron. Your next question comes from the line of Alex Bolstein from Goldman Sachs. Your line is open. Hey, thanks. Uh, good morning, Ron. Good morning, Eric. Um, so, so maybe just building on the last comment, I want to dig into CRD a little bit more. Um, as, as you think about the pipeline and CRD and sort of this uh, sizable implementation uh, opportunity you guys see, um, what percentage of that is the on-premise versus uh, kind of the SaaS type of contract? Um, and then secondly, I was hoping you guys could dig into the CRD wealth uh, strategy a little bit broadly. Thanks for some of the added disclosure there. But what kind of the what are the typical sort of client in the wealth management space? Is it a white house? Is it a you know, independent broker deal? Is it an RA? So just a little bit more flavor there. And which one of these channels incremental growth has been coming from? Thanks. Well, why don't I start there? Uh, Eric can talk about the, the the mix, Alex. But the uh, on the on, on the wealth channel, it tends to be the higher the larger wealth managers. And um, it's a combination, if I think about both, you know, what's installed uh, this quarter, but also what's uh, uh, where we have conversations and you know, we'll be installing in future quarters. It's a combination of the, of, of the wirehouses, and, you know, that obviously comes with lots of seats, as you would imagine, but also the, uh, the larger private wealth managers. I mean, they could be uh, RIAs, but, it, again, it tends to be the larger ones and the larger names. And, um, you know, if you think why that is, um, oftentimes they're bringing, uh, these institutions are bringing some fairly significant asset allocation capability uh, to bear. And while they want to give their advisors um, some freedom to customize, they also want to have a lot of control over that. And the CRD platform works really well in, in, in that regard. Um, and as I mentioned uh, in response to an earlier question, the, the great thing for us is is that this uh, it's it it certainly is a, uh, a bespoke application for the wealth segment, but it's it's leveraging um, you know much of the same underlying technology. So there's a lot of scale in all this, uh, both in terms of the initial development we've done, but also as we uh, as we roll out uh, uh, software improvements. And Alex, just to round out on the on the financials, we, we had a range of implementations uh, this quarter uh, on the on-premise side, the ones that are lumpier. You know, the range was uh, three years to eight years, um, and and it actually runs the gamut of you know 50 to 70 percent um, in the in the in the first year, and then the the, the balance rateably. Um, I think the, the largest of the implementations was actually on the, uh, uh, at the, on the uh, close to eight-year mark, which would be uh, uh, 50% uh, in the first year and the other 50% in the coming year, in the coming years. Gotcha. Thanks. Um, and then just maybe to round up the discussion around NIR, 
Um, so Eric, your comment around kind of stabilizing NIR towards the end of the year, does that already contemplate significant reinvestment of liquidity that you guys have built up on the balance sheet into securities and loans, or uh, with a little more reinvest into 21, could we maybe even see a little bit of growth from that sort of trough level of uh, net interest revenues? Thanks. Yeah, Alex, it's uh, a little early to get into 2021, to be honest, but um, we'll leave uh, the, the – um, the guide that I gave for Fort Q does, does contemplate some reinvestment in the uh, investment portfolio, and we're just, you know, kind of uh, uh, driving the balance. But the long-end rates do have a kind of a tail of effects for us, and so in a way, this is the time for us to add to the investment portfolio uh, and, uh, you know, do our work to, to offset what would naturally be a, a downward headwind. But uh, I think I think I think we're we're, we're, we've, we've got a path. It's just it, it's hard to it's hard to see growth in NII at this point. Um, we're uh, but, but we see a path to you know, relative stability within a range, but it's going to take some work. And um, you know we don't really know what happens with rates and and how they evolve. Uh, but uh, you know we we can we can see a path there. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks very much. Yeah. Your next question comes from the line of Jared Cassidy from RBC. Your line is open. Good morning, Ron. Good morning, Eric. Good morning. Good morning. Ron, can you follow up on the new wins that you guys gave us this quarter? And you mentioned in your comments about the stickiness of not losing um, customers. Are the wins primarily coming from existing customers where you're adding more products and services, and in the cases where you win a new customer, I think you alluded to lower prices, but can you share with us, is it price-driven that the new customers are coming over, or is it a combination of price and better products that you're offering them? Yeah, Gerard, I don't remember uh, referring to lower pricing in, in the context of the wins, but to, to answer your questions, um, the um, it, it's, it's a mix that we're seeing, and right now I'm referring to the uh, what we call our alpha front-to-back platform in Charles River. It, it's a mix of uh, of existing clients or new clients uh, that, that we're seeing, uh, and that's particularly true as I look at the uh, at, at the near-term pipeline. So, in, in for those existing clients, in, in effect, we're uh, we're, we're expanding our share of activity with them, to use the vernacular, expanding the wallet, um, where we might historically have had a back office custody relationship, uh, and we're moving to the middle in the front office. Um, but beyond that, in the in the kind of uh, more traditional core business, uh, we we continue to see a a fair amount of outsourcing there too. Uh, firms that had historically done uh, everything but custody inside, you know, where, where we might have been one or, or, or the only custodian, are, <clears throat> are now reconsidering that and moving things like fund accounting out. Um, middle office would be another big part of that because, in effect, our middle office business is the outsourcing of their back office, and that solves lots of, of challenges for them, and we've learned how to scale that business. Um, so uh, that, that that would give you a, a sense of all that. I mean, what has been pleasing about the pipeline as it's developed, and again, given the comprehensive nature of what we do, these pipelines do take a while to move from um, <clears throat> when there's the first contact to the actual signing of the business. Uh, but what's pleasing about that is we're seeing a, a fair number of, of new clients there to us. Um, and the, the attractive thing about that is to really get the full advantage of the front-to-back platform, uh, we're able to show that, yeah, we can do the Charles River and middle office for you, but we're going to get real data advantages is having the full front-to-back. So it fuels growth in our traditional back office business. Very good. And then, Eric, I know it's not as material to your business as a traditional bank, but your loan portfolio, you mentioned you've exited some of the leveraged loans. Two questions. One, can you 
give us any color on the industries in which you de-risk the balance sheet from? And second, what type of pricing did you see when you sold um, those leverage loans? Thank you. Sure. Um, Gerard, we're trying to be uh, um, you know, proactive here, right? The, the leverage loan market has really moved up and down a, a good bit um, and just finding some points where it might make sense. Uh, we de-risked uh, roughly about $160 million of balances uh, of leveraged loans. I remember, uh, you know, one of the cinema chains was was in that, and we 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 got out at a, a good price. I think the average pricing on the exits was around, uh, I think, around 92 cents. I want to say on the dollar, so somewhere in that range. So we feel like we made some, you know, good tactical decisions. It didn't cost us that much because we would have had to build a reserve anyway for those, and that's why I said on that, you know, 160 million, it cost us effectively a net six. But for the, you know, peace of mind and just trying to be careful because we are a trust and custody bank and that's our brand, you know, we felt like it was a, a good trade, and we'll continue to selectively do that. But in truth, we we feel um, quite good about this uh, this loan book. I mean, it's a uh, 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 most leverage loans are uh, 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 in the indices are, are single B and 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 uh, below. Ours are double B and and sometimes even better. Uh, and so I think we're we're pretty confident here. But you know, there's always something, and uh, we just uh, we're, we're happy to be uh, proactive uh, and uh, uh, make some uh, tactical decisions. Um, and that's what we did. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Mike Mayo from Wells Fargo Securities. Your line is open. Hi. Um, so you're, you're guiding for better fee growth for this year, one and a half to two percent, you know, versus down before. Uh, how much of that is already reflected in the first half results, and how much should be coming in the second half? You mentioned servicing fees, management fees, FX processing, but is this mostly reflecting what you've done already or is it mostly to come? And as a subcomponent of that, when it comes to uh, CRD, uh, I guess link quarter revenues were up 45 million and pre-tax was up 42 million. So I guess that's what a 93% incremental profit margin. So that leads me to ask, um, you know, are there some upfront revenues with the new business wins and the, you know, in terms of the timing between the revenues and the expenses, how does that work out? And then lastly, if I can throw it in there, you are going to be a client of CRD, and how, how's that moving along? Thanks. Sure, Mike. It's uh, Eric. Let me take the uh, the first couple, uh, and then I think Ron will uh, probably want to take the uh, the uh, the third. Um, in terms of the full year guide, you're right. There's a number of different pieces to it. There are some pieces of the full year uh, one and a half to two percent fee revenue guide that are driven by the first half of the year, and there are some that'll be driven by I think continued progress in the second half. Um, I think if you just go through the line items, you know, servicing fees have been good for the first half, and we expect them to continue to be good. So I think that'll be a continued uh, uh, story. Management fees, you know, largely because of markets, so I think a little lighter in the first half. We're hoping that they come in a little uh, stronger on a year-on-year -year basis in the second half. Um, FX, obviously, a first-half story where the second half will not be there. Uh, SEC finance has been light for us in the first half. Uh, we're hoping for some and looking for some stability there um, and some uh, sequential uh, um, uh, uh, some, some sequential stability, if not some, you know, a little bit of, of uptick. Um, and then you have Charles River, where we obviously got a, a big part in the uh, – in the second quarter, um, but uh, and that maybe end up being a little more first half weighted. But I think you're, you you typically um, get uh, get performance uh, in the fourth quarter of these software businesses. So we'll see. Uh, I think some uh, um, some activity there. So a little bit of a, a mix, to be honest. Um, on Charles River, the um, the. Uh, good question. On the on-premise installations in particular or the renewals, but I think it's really on a kind of combination of the new implementations, you do get some professional servicing fees where we bill revenues and we incur expenses. 
and um, my recollection is those are fairly aligned. The, the accounting standards uh, encourage us to do that. Um, but they're, I think the, the, the professional services tend to be billed as incurred and then, um, and, and part of the, what I described as the more stable part of the revenues. And what we're finding is there's just a, there's, there's, there's professional services in, uh, installation work that we do for kind of, um, uh, coming client, you know, clients that are not yet implemented but are on their way to implementation. There's some during the implementation that last sprint, and then there's clients behind that. So it's a bit of a mix, to be honest, but something we can try to um, uh, uh, parse out a little more detail in future, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, conferences or uh, or calls. Yeah, and Mike. Uh, and regarding uh, 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 your, the last part of your question, which is. Uh, uh, State Street Global Advisors becoming a client of Charles River. They're actually uh, becoming a client of the full uh, Alpha front-to-back platform, including uh, Charles River. Uh, so it's a it's a fairly uh, comprehensive install, and it's it's underway. Right, it's uh, the the inflation's happening. What what? Because uh, you're going to be like a that, that'll be a nice showcase once you get that done. As you say, we use it ourselves. You should use it too. Kind of what inning are you in as far as implementing it internally? Uh, I mean, I'm I'm, I'm uh, somewhat speculating here now, but we're well over half installed is the way I would describe it. And again, it it's okay. not just installing Charles River, but it's you know moving the State Street Global Advisors back office to our middle office platform. Um, it's accommodating uh, some existing technology that they have in place too. So. Um, as you'd imagine, it's a $3.1 trillion asset manager. It's pretty complicated, um, So, uh, but it's well over halfway along. And j just one last clarification, Eric. So the CRD revenues, should we, you know, $145 million, uh, in the second quarter, should I, and I, this is getting pretty granular, but is that something that's kind of lumpy, or are we, not a, we should extrapolate that out, or how should we think about that? No, it's it's lumpy, and Mike. That's why um, I was trying to give a little bit of color, but just to um, to 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 to, to um, reaffirm. You know, in that 145, we said there there's kind of very recurring, literally kind of uh, you know uh, re recurring revenues of just over 80, and then the balance is in the kind of lumpy category where you get these on-premise installations. I also, so you kind of have to take a piece of the lumpy and say, you know, there's always going to be lumpy because we have three-year contracts, five-year contracts, eight-year contracts, and every quarter, every year, there's some of those contracts roll over, and so you're going to get a new lumpiness, or you get new business that you add in the lumpy category. I also gave, um, uh, if, if you want another quarter as a, as a contrast, back a year ago, second quarter of 19, we have $90 million of total revenues. And I said we had about 65 million of the very uh, kind of recurring SaaS and professional services revenues, and just a smaller piece of that was lumpy. So, you know, you can kind of, I think, draw some lines and say the the lumpiness. This is a this is a this is big lumpy. That that's for sure. But there's always going to be some. Um, but I think I think hopefully I've given you enough on the 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 kind of SaaS and uh, professional services to. Let you extrapolate from there, and then you know put in something in the models on the on the lumpy part. Great, thanks a lot. Yeah. Your next question comes from the line of Jim Mitchell from Seaport Global Securities. Your line is open. Hey, good morning. Um, maybe just we could talk a little bit of a question on the the new business wins you've had and the cadence and impact. If I look at new business to be installed, you have about a trillion to go. That's been pretty stable since the big wins in 3Q09, I mean 19. So is is it on these bigger bigger wins, does it just really take this long? Is there something unusual here? And and, and I guess going forward with the new, the new business wins you've alluded to in the second half this year, is it a similar kind of time to install? Yeah, Jim, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, the... Um, uh, when you see this kind of uh, to be installed 
uh, a backlog, if you will, um, that typically reflects that there's um, multiple tranches of business. So, for example, it could be custody and fund accounting and middle office. Um, and a custody conversion we can do very quickly, right? We've we right. literally did some. Uh, uh, you know, we were notified by a client that they wanted to move in the midst of the crisis, and you know, we got it done intra quarter. Those move quickly, and so oftentimes don't even show up in in this backlog here. I mean, they would if it was carrying over to a quarter. Um, what you're seeing here is. Um, uh, clients, including some very large clients that have multiple tranches of business that they're um, either moving over from an existing provider um, or in some cases moving from an in-source to an outsource model. And again, that reflects the nature of our business. Um, uh, we're using our ability to do these kinds of, uh, of outsourcing to actually drive not just the outsourced business, but uh, to drive traditional core custody, which you know, scales easily and you know, is quite profitable to us. But that's how you should uh, think about that, um, is that um, you know, in any given quarter, our new business wins will be some very traditional custody to custody kinds of things or fund accounting to fund accounting. Uh, but oftentimes the backlog reflects just much more comprehensive kinds of moves. Right, and should should we assume that those those more complex deals have a higher fee rate? Should we see a little bit more of a material impact on servicing fees when they when they close? Well, what you should expect to see is that um, there's fees coming from more than one source, right? The, the custody fee, a fund accounting fee, a middle office fee, et cetera. Right. That's what that's how you should think about it. Okay, thanks. Your next question comes from the line of Vivek to Jamaja from JP Morgan. Your line is open. Vivek, we can't hear you. Vivek, if you're on mute, please unmute. Are you there, Vivek? And there are no further questions at this time. I'll turn the call back over to Ron Hanley for closing remarks. Well, uh, thank you, Operator, and, and thanks to all of you on the call who joined us. Thanks for the questions, and uh, we look forward to the follow-up. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.